Well, hello, and welcome to another Space Foundation Space Commerce Entrepreneurial Interview. I'm Shelley Brunswick, Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation. Today, I have the privilege to talk to Austin Link. Hello, Austin. Welcome to our show. Hello, Shelley. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Well, let me share with our audience a little bit about your background. So Austin is the co-founder at Starfish Space, where he's giving life to on-orbit services. Originally from Iowa, he then went to Stanford for a BS in physics and later Purdue for an MS in aerospace engineering. In the aerospace industry, Austin has worked at Lockheed Martin on THAAD and at Blue Origin on a variety of launch vehicles and engines. His particular focus has been on space system architecture, modeling and operating under uncertainty, all tools that are being applied at Starfish Space. Outside of aerospace, Austin lives in Kent, Washington with his fiance, Jess, and their three Basset Hounds. He also occasionally coaches high school basketball. Well, I don't know how you have time to coach high school basketball, amazing. We're, we're kind of figuring that out right now. It's a, a six week season starting off at the moment and we're gonna see how much I can do. All I'll right. do my best, it's fun. It is fun. You got to have a good hobby uh, besides work and being an entrepreneur, which leads me to our first really question that I got to ask you. You and your co-founder, Trevor Bennett, are former Blue Origin engineers. What made you want to start Starfish a year and a half ago? Well, um, so first, it's it's worth highlighting. Blue Origin was an awesome place to work, right? And, and I was incredibly fortunate to be there uh, over an incredibly exciting period of time. There's an awesome group of engineers all through the company and, and kind of a tremendous high level vision too that, that's inspiring on a daily basis. Um, what happened for Trevor and I, and, and Trevor and I were, were close friends before Starfish, right? And, and as we had conversations, we just got really excited about the idea of a space tug. And, and there's two things about the space tug for satellite servicing that got us excited. And so number one, as we look at the future of space and, and the future of the off-world economy and what are humans going to do as we expand out into the final frontier, I think that that what stood out to both Trevor and I was, um, boy, there's a, it's really important to have autonomy, to have logistics, to have robotics as just the technological infrastructure that the off-world economy is going to build upon. And we see a space tug is eventually part of that infrastructure. Now, a challenge is that as you look at large manufacturing in orbit, assembly in orbit, tourism, generating power, mining, these are all great things for the future off-world economy. They are all um, potentially a long way off and challenging to build a business around right now. And um, what's really exciting about satellite servicing is, hey, these are the same autonomy, logistics, robotics technologies that we start today and, and we can provide value to customers today. Um, and so that's got what got us really excited. That's what got our, our wheels turning, our brains spinning. And then as an engineer, it's always uh, a little bit of a calculated decision. And so you run the numbers and you say, okay, I think we can do this for a while. And, uh, and then what really gave me confidence as part of it all was being able to work with Trevor because he's, he's uh, just a, a great person to work with and a great engineer and a great entrepreneur. So I've been really fortunate in that sense. Excellent. That's exciting. Now, I think for some of our audience, we're going to have to take this back just a step and say, you're developing a space tug. So what exactly is a space tug and what is its purpose and, and why is it important, as you said, in this global space, current or future ecosystem? Yeah. So a, a space tug sort of broadly as a term is, is a, a satellite that interacts with other satellites in orbit. And it, we kind of differentiate, there are some folks who use the term space tug for a delivery into orbit at the beginning of a satellite's life, almost a, a kick stage on a rocket to take you up and drop you off. Um, our, our use of the term space tug in this sense is more on the satellite servicing side. And you know we're not the only ones looking at servicing. There's a lot of uh, uh, great companies out there and you know, Northrop Grumman, the mission extension vehicle is really exciting. And I know Astroscale is starting on the LC, LCD mission. And in general, the value of satellite servicing is it allows you to get more out of your satellites. 
And there's, there's kind of two primary missions in that. And so one is you can help extend the life of an existing satellite that they may be limited by the amount of propellant they have on board. And, and as a space tug, like our otter, you can come and attach to the back of that satellite and, and fulfill the same role that the propellant and propulsion system was doing. Um, and then the second aspect of this, and this is one that maybe we can thank Sandra Bullock is a little bit more in the popular consciousness, is, um, is, is space debris. And as we launch more and more satellites, especially you know, over the 2020s here, we're going to be launching five times as many satellites as all of human history until now. And that means that that space debris really becomes a, a challenge that threatens this infrastructure that a variety of companies and organizations around the world are developing in orbit. And so if we want to preserve this infrastructure, we need the ability to, to help clear out dead satellites, which are effectively just threats and hazards for this infrastructure. And that's the that's the important uh, the importance of the satellite servicing, importance of uh, a space tug like our otter and all of this is is we allow satellites to to continue to do and to really maximize the the things that they're designed to do and the value that they provide for people here on Earth. That's excellent. And, and so I think that really helped our audience understand what what a tug is and how we're going to do how you're going to do satellite servicing. I do want to pivot back to the space debris removal. Um, we do know that is becoming more challenging. We see that on the news. We know that the UN has a sustainability development goal for, you know, for looking at debris as well, uh, both on the planet, but also the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. So can you explain to our audience, you know, you shared a little bit about the launches going up and the problem and, and the challenge, like you said, with Sandra Bullock's movie, but can you explain what does that really mean if, if we don't start removing the debris or thinking about debris mitigation? What will that really mean to our usability of space? So in the broad scheme, satellites left in orbit, especially above a certain altitude, stay in orbit for forever. And, and as the number of satellites increases, you have um, the potential to, to collide and you create more debris when you collide. And you know the ultimate case that is is always used when describing space debris is Kessler syndrome, and that's when you have um, debris that triggers a chain reaction and effectively destroys all of the infrastructure that you have in that orbit. Now that um, is 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 sort of the ultimate, the worst case that's, that space debris can go. And if that were to happen, then um, you know it's, everybody's satellite TV goes out everybody's uh, GPS goes out and, and, and you can't navigate anywhere. You can't use your financial systems that rely on GPS. And so uh, the infrastructure that we built in space is hugely important for the things that we're doing today. Um, and it, it turns out that orbits, like many things on Earth, are, are really scarce natural resources. And you have to take action to preserve them. And, and Many satellite operators already do, right? They, they take efforts to go to um, disposal orbits called graveyard orbits or to re-enter into the atmosphere to make sure that they're not leaving behind debris in these valuable orbits that are scarce natural resources. Um, but really the key that, that changes this decade and the reason that this is the time, now is the time to be solving this problem um, is that the problem scales dramatically with the number of satellites. And, <sighs> There are satellites and they have been in orbits, but people are also, space is a big place. And so it's only at a certain level that, it, only at a certain number of satellites that this really becomes a, a serious threat to the infrastructure that we have in orbit. Um, and with all of the launches of companies like, you know, SpaceX with Starlink and OneWeb and Amazon Kuiper and Telesat and, and just a, a massive proliferation of satellite constellations, we think the time is now and, and space debris is really going to be a threat to these very valuable constellations unless unless we're taking the actions to mitigate the debris and ensure that we're preserving the preserving these orbits to be able to continue to operate and, and provide service to people. That that's an excellent description. And I was talking to some individuals earlier who are, you know, interested in, you know, those large constellations and the benefits they bring. But as you said, the management of those 
of those areas that have to be managed just like any other precious resource and that your company is going to help maintain that. So that's fantastic. Um, and obviously debris removal is a huge issue. You did talk earlier about the profitability. You and Trevor ran the numbers and you think you can do this. So how have you formed a business model around this service to eventually, you know, make it profitable? That's part of the challenge, right? And not just with space debris, but almost with uh, with the variety of environmental concerns that, that they they suffer from a, a tragedy of the commons, as it's called. That we all have the potential negative effects, but that doesn't mean that any of us are incentivized to to pay to solve the problem because the negative effects are spread across all of us. Um, and it, the challenge in here as well, if we're going to solve this, and, and Trevor and I have chosen the the approach of creating a business to try to solve um, to solve the debris problem and, and, and provide other capabilities that come with satellite servicing. And to do that well, you have to provide value that outweighs your costs and be able to, to get the money to continue operating as a business. Um, for us, the way that a space tug makes financial sense is not disposing of all of a constellation satellites, but we dispose of a portion. We're really a supplementary disposal method. And so the, the value proposition for a, a satellite constellation is to say, look, you may think that you would normally be operating for five years. You could take a chance and operate six or seven years. You know, if you do that, 5%, 10% of your satellites aren't going to make it. If you use Starfish to clean up that last five to 10%, you can get that extra year or two out of every satellite. The additional value that you get for that oftentimes is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And these constellations are, are large investments. And, and that dwarfs the cost that you pay for the supplemental space tug. Excellent. You talked a little earlier in your intro about, you know, that future global economy, you know, will be interplanetary species. And, you know, and that started with small steps where we started in low Earth orbit, which is where a lot of these satellites are. And we hope to have the cis lunar orbit and then to Mars. So how does a your space tug help us develop those first few steps for that off world economy? And in your mind, what is that big picture and how does developing the space tug influence that future off world development? So, you know, we all, we're all space nerds, right, Shelly? You, I, probably everybody listening. And, uh, and we all have the different parts of the future off-world economy that excite us and, and that get us motivated and go, boy, this is uh, an exciting future to dream about as, as, as a species and as a planet. Um, I know for me, one of, the, one of the, the big visions that I would love to do, and maybe I've watched too much 90s television, but I would love to be, Jean-Luc Picard standing on the deck of the Enterprise someday. Um, I'm, I'm curious to help frame some of the, well, how does this get to that long-term goal, that off-world economy? Shelly, for you, what gets you excited about the future in space? What gets you jumping out of bed in the morning and go, hey, I want this to happen. I want to make this happen. What gets me excited? I, I, I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to smart people like you who are telling me how we're going to make it happen. And then I like to be the advocate who goes out and shares that message with everyone. And, and when you're advocating, when you're sharing, like, look, this is what can happen in space. What in the future of space is, is most exciting to you? What I find most exciting a lot of times is what we benefit here on earth. So I, I, you know, I was just on some calls earlier today internationally. And so, many of those countries and parts of the world are looking at how space can benefit them here on planet earth. So that really gets me excited thinking about how do we use space for growing agriculture and energy solutions and healthcare benefits and better transportation. And like you said, all the technology that we're benefiting here on earth. So what I share with people is it's super exciting to be thinking about going to Mars, but all the technology we're gonna use to get there with how we're gonna, you know, human, humankind living on another planet with in in you know different gravity, and how does that affect the human body and create new medical breakthroughs and energy and agriculture and water management? I love sharing the story about how another entrepreneur, it may not be you, um, but an entrepreneur who says, "Wow, that's great technology. I want to commercialize that 
and, and bring that to planet Earth and make planet Earth a better place. And so I get excited about that technology transfer. And then I also get excited about sharing the message about space and all the careers that are available in space, all the careers from the supply chain that is helping you manufacture the parts and pieces for your tug, all the way to the rocket scientist yourself, you know, who's developing it. I love all those jobs in between. And I want to be out there telling everyone that we can help them find a place in this new global space ecosystem. Yeah, and I, uh, that's that's awesome. And that is incredibly exciting. And I think that aligns a lot with, with some of what we talk about at Starfish and that, hey, you know, we're going to space, but it's to provide value for the people on Earth. And, um, and this is... This is, I know, a little bit of a blue originism also, right? They go to space to help Earth out. Uh, and the way that we see we really fit into this is as you think about the next generation of things that you might be able to do into space that help people on Earth, you think about, well, what if we could do manufacturing? What if, what if we could um, create materials or create pharmaceuticals that can help people on Earth, but we have to create them in space? You think, well, what if there's, um, what if we could have larger satellites that can provide connectivity to more people? What if we could generate power in space and then we don't have to have power stations here on earth? And many of these next waves involve, well, you're not going to build an entire power plant and then stick it on top of a rocket and send it up there. Um, you have to do activities. You have to be dynamic and interactive in orbit. And the capabilities, the, the, the logistics, the robotics, the autonomy that today does things in kind of extending value, you know, adding 30, 40% onto a satellite's lifetime. Well, in the future, that's also the infrastructure that enables this whole new set of capabilities. And so you can imagine someday, boy, we don't have a power plant here. We're, we're just collecting solar and then we're just transferring that down to earth. And to, to create that power plant, you probably need to get materials from other locations. And that's transportation and, and uh, autonomous operations and you need to to build this power station and that's robotics and there's shuttling of parts around and all of this is is standing on top of the same technologies that we can start to develop today as part of the satellite servicing industry and that's what makes that's what makes me really excited right as I slowly come to terms with like maybe I'm not ever going to stand on the enterprise. Um, but I can talk to Siri and pretend like it every once in a while. Um, but but we can be part of the pathway there and and we can help build the infrastructure and help develop space in a way that it provides values to to the humans all here on earth. Absolutely. I love that. And I loved how you turned the tables around and made me the, you know, you were the interviewer. So uh, really good switch there. I am <laughs> going to ask you, so you do have some exciting news coming up um, that, you know, Starfish Space is launching its software this June on a SpaceX Falcon 9 for your first in-space demonstration. What is your goal with that in-space demonstration? What are you hoping yeah. to discover and learn? Well, this is a really exciting step for us as a, as a company here. Um, and, you know, the nature of a startup is, is I sit here and I talk about the big picture things and where will we be someday and where will we help in the off-world economy but it really is a long road to get there. And you have to be diligent about, well, what is the path to get there? And you have to celebrate the successes that you have. Um, and we've been fortunate to have some successes in this, this test this summer is a big highlight of them. So as we've explored the, the, the technological space and as we've explored the development of Otter, to us, there is one thing that stands out as, as the key technology to be able to do all of these in a reliable happen and in, in a reliable manner. And that's rendezvous proximity operations and docking or, or our pod as it's often called. And that's really the challenge of how does our space tug here come up to the satellite here and, and move in and safely dock with it and not smash your solar panel and, and create more debris and not misalign and attach to something that's gonna fall right off. Um, and it, that rendezvous proximity operations and docking is a, a challenging process. And, and we've decided to make it a little more challenged on ourselves because we're trying to do it in a particularly efficient but difficult manner. And that's by using exclusively um, electric propulsion, which is a very fuel efficient propulsion type for satellites. Um, so our test this summer, 
we're going to be testing out this software, which, which we call Cephalopod because Starfish Space and Otter and Cephalopod and, and we, we spend a lot of time Googling aquatic names and it's wonderful. Uh, but, but we're gonna be testing Cephalopod on orbit. Um, it's going up in late June or maybe early July because we know how rocket launches go. Um, but, but we'll be able to begin testing in the August timeframe. And we're going to fly a couple of proximity operations traje trajectories. And we're really going to be able to validate our software and the algorithms behind it and the physics modeling that we do when we test locally. Um, and so for us, this is a, a tremendous demonstration on, look, we're building great confidence in our software and our ability to model and continue to develop the software so that as we move towards the otter, when the otter is actually operating around somebody else's satellite, we can trust it. We know that it's reliable. We know that it's safe, that it's precise, um, and, and that we're going to be able to provide a successful service to our customers. Um, we should also highlight in this that, as, as you well know, Shelley, part of the part of what makes all of this possible is that there's a, a series of amazing companies and individuals working throughout the space industry. And the only reason why we can go to orbit and test in, in anything like the the or the or the timeline of the company that we're in right now is because we're working with great people. And, and so I should, should really extend, uh, or as we try to do regularly, extend our thanks to people like Astro Digital who build the satellite, people like Orbit Fab who's coordinating the mission, Benchmark Space Systems and their thrusters that we're using, Axion Space Systems and their thrusters that we're using, um, and it's really part of the excitement of the new wave of space that there are lots of companies that are all working towards towards this this future in orbit and towards providing new capabilities for the people on Earth below. Um, and and it's been great to partner with all of these companies and work with them. And we're really thankful for that. That's excellent. You shared a number of great tips along the way about proper financing and partnerships, and and you've accomplished so much in a year and a half. What is some advice you'd like to give to others who want to enter this space ecosystem? You know, I'll confess, Shelley, I don't know if there's enough data points or enough sample size to really say anybody should trust any portion of Austin's advice. Um, and, and, and we try to remember that about ourselves when, when we set out, maybe I'll relay somebody else's advice then. When we set out to start Starfish Space, talked with a number of friends from a number of backgrounds and a couple of my friends who, who have started and successfully developed companies. And one of them sat me down and he said, it's so awesome. What an incredible journey. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to pour yourself into it and it'll be really fulfilling and exhausting. And, and he said, but you need to know, Austin, engineers make the worst founders. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? I think engineers would be great founders. You know, engineers make the worst founders. And the reason that engineers make the worst founders is you're going to spend all of your time sitting there doing engineering, building some cool product until you just run out of money. Um, and he said, you need to understand this because engineers that know engineers make the worst founders and are able to successfully correct for their biases and their shortcomings in the process can be the best founders. Um, but I think that that's something that, that we try to pay attention to, and uh, you know, all just stems from that advice and and limits, and maybe makes hypocritical any answer to this question is 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 recognizing that uh, that we have a small sample size and we're early in the process, and we found a few things that we believe have been successful for us, um, but there's a long way to go, uh, and and we need to continue to learn, and we need to continue to develop, and build our, build our skills, and build our team if we're going to actually operate the otter, if we're going to actually provide infrastructure for an off-world economy that helps people here on Earth. Um, and so I know that's, you know, uh, take that with a grain of salt because of all the reasons that I just explained, but that's something that that was advised to me early in the process. And that's something that I and, and Trevor and our whole team, we, we try to pay attention to our own, our own uncertainties and our own, uh, you know, the learnings that we need to do. Well, I think that makes you a great CEO that demonstrates your emotional intelligence. So I think that's a fantastic way to wrap things up with our audience. I do want to thank you. And I do hope that you'll come back and share some of your, your findings from this launch and this demonstration with us. You know, you said in August, you'll get some data. Maybe you'll come back in September, October and share more with us about how things are going. 
Yeah, it's a, an exciting process. We'll get we'll get some great data coming out of it. We'll love to update you along the way. And and you know, I just want to extend a thanks to you and and some of the work that Space Foundation does. Right, a little part of what put us on this journey was for me a, a trip to the space symposium back in. 2019, which as long ago as it feels, I guess, is really the last time that an in-person space symposium happened. But um, you know, the the what to me is always great about the space industry is that um, is is the space industry and the ties among the industry and the bonds that we have together, because we're all dreaming of the same thing. And whether we're whether we're Jean-Luc Picard on the deck of the Enterprise or whether we're Sandra Bullock and we're trying to navigate our way through various space stations, we all have dreams of being in, in space and, and doing exciting things for the future of humans. Um, and, and it's awesome to be able to work together with everybody in the process. And so the work that people like you and, and many others do to help cultivate the industry like this is, is really awesome. And I really appreciate you having, having us on to be a little part of it. Well, we are grateful for you joining us today. And I guess that means I have to be Captain Janeway then, a Voyager. I, that's a, that's another great captain along the way. There you go. Well, thank you so much. I would also like to thank our audience for joining us today. And if they'd like to learn more about space commerce and our entrepreneurship series, they can go to our website at spacefoundation.org. Thank you. And we look forward to you joining us for another awesome entrepreneurial interview. There's a place for everyone in the new global space ecosystem. <laughs>